a potentially glorious Arsenal season hangs in the balance. Sunday's home defeat against Aston Villa means the initiative's been handed to Manchester City in the Premier League title race. And last week's 2-2 draw with Bayern means the Gunners have work to do to keep their Champions League dream alive. Bayern have suffered the indignity of watching Bayer Leverkusen take their Bundesliga title away and their whole campaign rests on Wednesday's clash. I'm Kevin Hatchard and this is Football Only Better. The big games get the big names, starting with Mark O'Hare. Mark, Arsenal was strangely jittery against Bayern and they've had some disappointing and maybe naive displays in the knockout phase of this competition. Yep, I think that's fair and accurate. Um, I talked up Arsenal as a 1.8 shot a week ago ahead of that first leg tie against Bayern Munich and I found that price was was perfectly um, palatable really going into that first leg. Uh, I thought we were on a, a good value price and you know, after recording on Monday uh, until kickoff on Tuesday, the money came for Arsenal. Their price trended quite downwards, uh, eventually going off around the 165 mark. So, you know, I was quite pleased with the market beat. But the closer we got to kickoff, the more the price narrowed and the more I thought about the game, the more I actually got concerned uh, with my position on Arsenal. And I did try to to exit it at some point because I almost felt the odds gone a bit too far. And I'd almost flip reverse my position to try and get Bayern on side in some way or form because after seeing that team sheet, the abundance of obvious quality in that Bayern Munich team, especially in forward areas, plus, as you say, that kind of last chance saloon element to their season. They've clearly given up retaining the Bundesliga title and now the Champions League is the, the, the only aim, really, for the rest of the campaign. Kind of made them a bit of a dangerous animal, really. And um, I guess it showed, really, because they produced one of their best performances of the season. Um, saying that, I did think, as you say, Arsenal contributed to it too defensively. The side that's looked really rock solid in 2024 did look jittery at times. Uh, and the concerns that came to the four against Porto really sort of reared their head as well. But yeah, they just looked really uneasy against the counter-attack and made some really sloppy errors. Looked genuinely uncomfortable against pace, um, which is a surprise because they, they've dealt with it pretty well so far this season. But um, I guess fortunately now for Arsenal, Alfonso Davies is suspended and, and Serge Gnabry is, is seemingly out through injury. So that left-hand side for Bayern... Um, has been blunted a little bit, not too much. Kingsley Coman is a, a very handy replacement. I do think Rafael Guerrero is a, a step down, though, even if Davies um, hasn't been at his best uh, this season. So, but whereas you know you look at Bayern um, and then compare with Arsenal, there probably is now uh, an element of mental and physical fatigue coming to the party. I think we've seen that in some of their performances. Um, they have been pretty relentless in 2024 and their schedule has been very tough. So, you know, since February, Arsenal have faced Porto twice, Liverpool, Man City, Villa on Sunday, and of course, Bayern too, alongside seven other matches. So some really high profile games, as well as quite a, a heavy schedule too. And, you know, perhaps it's fatigue. It's difficult to sort of know what's quite gone wrong in the last week or so for Arsenal because they have been so good this calendar year. But uh, I did see a number of concerning aspects of that Bayern performance kind of rear its ugly head again against Aston Villa at the weekend. Again, they looked troubled by pace on the counter-attack and in transitions. Again, they gave up uh, shot tallies they haven't really done often this season. Uh, we know Erdegaard got substitu substituted with a bit of a knock as well. He was probably their one shining light. I'm sure he'll be OK and he'll be fit to play here. But there's enough concerns for me to leave Arsenal alone here. And I think the market does agree because they made them pretty strong fouls, not just to win the first game, but to qualify too. And, and their prices, you know, Bayern are now, um, you know, down to, what, 250 to, to win this first leg, to win this second leg, uh, and to, to, to qualify they're now favourites too. So you can actually get them on side with a zero ball start at 182. And um, but the issue for me with Bayern is I, I just don't trust their defence still. And um, that Arsenal team going forward has still got the capability to to put them to the sword too. So the wager that makes me feel most comfortable going into this game, uh, again, is to kind of do a rinse and repeat from what we saw in the first leg, which is to back goals. Um, we know Bayern are very, very rarely blanked, especially in Munich. Uh, you have to be at your, your absolute best to, to sort of deny them those opportunities. But, um, you know, the, the flip side is, can can you trust them to silence Arsenal or any side for that matter? Uh, probably not really. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of just going to go over two and a half goals and both teams to score here at about 183. If we do get a first half goal or an early goal, as we got in many, nearly all last week's ties, this should really open up and be quite exciting and entertaining. Um, Bayern will go for it, obviously. Arteta will probably be a bit more handbrake on, but you know, I think with that Bayern side, you know, those goals are almost guaranteed. So I'm quite happy to take that price.
trader, tipster, and four times the champion collector of Ronnie Johnson memorabilia, Emmett O'Keefe, is with us. Uh, Emmett, this is where we find out, I guess, if Bayern still have that steel of champions, that big game swagger. And Mark mentioned some of the injuries they have. We know Gnabry's out again. Kingsley Coman limped out to the game against Köln at the weekend. So, you know, he might be out as well. But they've got Matisse Tell. They've got Jabal Musiala. They've got Thomas Müller, who scored at the weekend. And of course, they have Harry Kane. And yes, he hit the post at the weekend, had other good chances, but he's been scoring in volume all season long. Yeah, absolutely. I like Mark. I find this a very hard game to call. Um, unfortunately, I was one of these things last week where, when you you could see see the team sheets, you just think, "Oh no, I should I shouldn't have given that tip." Like, cause again, all Arsenal backers were not hoping to see the name Manuel Neuer in the starting eleven. I think that's to me that was the biggest kind of difference last week. The kind of stability no, 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 Neuer gave Bayern, and I think as well for, for, from kickouts as well. I think it's kind of. It's kind of one of these things that isn't measured, I think, brilliantly by statistics currently. Um, I'm sure football clubs have proprietary statistics that can measure it. But in terms of a keeper who can kind of break the press with these like 20 or 30 yard passes to get his team up the pitch, I think is incredibly valuable. And I think Neuer can do it as as good, if not, if, if, if not better than most keepers. And the kind of the, again, it's hard to measure by statistics. Again, the kind of confidence that Neuer would give the defenders around him. Um, and it's, it's, so I think he, he certainly makes a massive difference. Like in terms of trusting Bayern though, to back it up, like, like Conrad Limer, I thought had probably the best game I've ever seen him play last week. I think he played, he was screening the defence like nearly in Golo Kante at times. I just think, like I, 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 I don't necessarily trust to kind of that to repeat itself. Like Bayern have the, um, Bayern are outside. They're 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 kind of sixth in the Bundesliga in terms of goals as goals conceded. So when you look at the big sample size. The Bayern defense can't be trusted as as well organized, and kind of, and kind of as well as they pl- played last week. I can't trust a repeat there. I also it didn't bite them last week, but the delict Eric Dyer centre half partnership is again. I have a huge question mark attached to that in terms of a lack of pace, and I just leaving a Kim in Jay for Eric Dyer like. Maybe Tom Tuchel <laughs> seems. Yeah, I don't something. get that either. Yeah, but Uppe Meccano has completely gone to pieces. I oh, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, that I, I, awful I, mistake at the weekend. Yeah, I think as well, listeners might remember his um, his collapse against Man City. Like, I think in uh, at the Etihad last evening, he was absolutely appalling and completely kind of lost his composure and was could barely, could barely pa- literally could barely pass the ball forward. Um, and so I think it's that I, I could, and after that and his performance in. Uh, Against Lazio, I can certainly see why he's not being picked, but I would have Kim and Jay as one of the best six or seven centre-backs in Europe, so in European football at the moment. So I think that's kind of a bit surprising. Um, and, and like Mark said, I think you just will be worried with both Liverpool and Arsenal is the kind of is is the kind of intense schedule catching up to them. Like I think like because it's it's hard to measure exactly, but the Premier League does have more injury time than most other leagues in Europe. There is there is potentially more slightly more fatigue on the Premier League on the Premier League clubs as the kind of minutes as the minutes pile up as we come to the end of the season. And I just thought it was noticeable yesterday in the in the Arsenal Aston Villa game had the Arsenal kind of press just wasn't it wasn't nearly the same with playing with the same intensity in the second half and Va- Aston Villa did play well but they could, I felt like they could, couldn't get out easier and it was just it was a, it was a really different game in the second half in terms of Arsenal ener- Arsenal's energy levels so I think that would definitely be a concern for me um but you could I guess you you could argue in that sense though as well that actually playing on the counter attack might actually suit Arsenal a little bit more not having to force the game and maybe if they can get into situations where they can isolate um Bayern centre halves and and full backs against the likes of Saka, Havertz, and, and and Martinelli if he plays that actually that actually might suit them. Like Mark said, I, I would lean goals. I think it's a really hard game to call from a win point of view. I think it'll be a, a kind of high scoring, entertaining game. One way I might look though, I thought, is just in terms of the card markets. Arsenal's um kind of leading card getter this season is Kai Havertz. He's had it in twenty eight. He's getting cards in twenty eight percent of his matches. And the beauty of Havertz is he can get cards in so many ways. He's such a piece of <laughs> prolific. He's a prolific fowler I won't say the word but I think listeners might know the word I'm talking about something housery which is he's um, oh, a, sh- a sugar house he's a sugar house sugar, as, sugar, you sugar, sugar, exactly. as you say around kids you learn to say sugar say, instead yeah, of yeah. the word that you're thinking yeah Def- 
to definitely use Kev. To, yeah, so I think he he's, he, he he can get done for time wasting. So I think he's 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 a I think he's he's a good guy to have on side in these markets, especially in such a high leverage game. Like if Arsenal go ahead, he will be the man kind of throwing the ball away when Barnett trying to take a free kick. So I think I like getting him on side around four to one. And who's a, when players are similar, kind of high card percentages is Matisse Delict. I just think in this type of game, when it's a bit more when Barnett playing a bit more front foot, I can see him kind of getting drawn out and kind of and committing fouls against Arsenal in the break. So maybe ha- Haver- Havertz and Delict in the card markets, that's kind of the big price, the way it look. What you find is as your kids get older, uh, you uh, remember to say sugar a bit less and make a few more errors as things go along. Last but not least, Sky Sports Lewis Jones joins us, still shaking his head at all of those goals, those pesky goals that we got in those first legs last week. Uh, Lewis, question for you. If Arsenal do crash out here, does that help or hinder their Premier League title chances? Obviously, your gut instinct would be that it would help because they get fewer games. But I just feel like that will be a real hammer blow from morale, a morale perspective. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, th- I think they need they need to find some momentum quickly, don't they, after what's happened over the past um, week or so. And this is a, a really... Really big fixture for them, I think, and it's gonna it's gonna tell us what they're really made of. Um, we know they're, they're a fantastic side, aren't they? But this is the moment where they really need to go and show that ability to sort of get it done in a in a big monster pressurized match um, out in Germany. So yeah, um, and I think that task has become more difficult now, having lost that momentum that I spoke about a moment ago and the confidence um, that they probably would have lost in their in the process that uh, Arteta likes to call it against Bayern. And then that Villa result yesterday was, um, would, would have really, would have really shook them, I think. And, and everyone associated with the club. So, yeah. And I've said this all season about Arsenal, really about them just providing me with no evidence to tell me they can be trusted to play with these sort of cool and calm heads in these high stakes environments. I've sort of swum against the tide a little bit with Arsenal this season. A lot of people have been telling me that they're finally ready to make the, make the step. And this team's very different, but I've always had that, that, um, sort of itch to 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 scratch in terms of their way that I just don't trust them in these big games. So, um, I suppose that's why I backed Man City to beat them and why I backed Porto to qualify against them at big big odds. So I haven't actually made any money on this theory yet, but the plan is to turn that around on on Wednesday, and I'm I'm already on Bayern to qualify. Um, so there's no need for me to really to get involved. Um. It, um, personally, at the moment, so, I mean, I'd say pro- quite quite a good spot now that Bayern at one point eight one. Uh, to qualify on the bet on the Betfair exchange, but I wouldn't put anyone off um, jumping on that price now. So I, th- I think Bayern, I think Bayern will get through this tie actually, and I think the price is okay. Um, and even Mikel Arteta admitted after the Villa the Villa game, this is a quote of, of his yesterday. Um, we lacked a lot of composure. We rushed things with the ball, and that's I think that's quite. He's only quite a guarded character, Arteta. and doesn't really s- let things like that slip. What he says in the dressing room out in a press conference, and I just think that just provides a bit of a guide of of how how they're playing in these big games at the moment and how sort of un, untrustworthy they are and they're not really staying calm when they when they should they're getting the the, the emotions are taken over in these big games again like like they've done in the in the past few years and they haven't really learned from especially that Porto game they 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 they've just can continue to do the same continue to make the same mistakes in that regard and I totally agree with Mark about the mental and physical um fatigue actually of this um of this period I I think that goes against them um for Wednesday night as well and I think I can I can see them offering up a similar sort of type of type of performance at the Alliance I do think Bayern are in a good spot here um and I haven't watched much of Bayern this season but and it's obviously been quite chaotic following it from afar for what's going on there but I just thought they were in their element actually at the Emirates in a game where they didn't have to force the issue. Um, obviously, you've seen them more more than me, Kev, but they just looked at ease and playing like they were quite comfortable on the counter attack. I thought, and they like unleashing Sane in the transition. That's where they're sort very of, good. Sort of That's yeah. where they're very good. Well, in Can... transition, the irony is transition is their greatest strength and their greatest weakness because. Hmm. When a game gets stretched, they're so good. Like Musiala can do his thing. Kane is obviously able to finish everything. They've got guys like Matty's Tell, Coman when he's fit, Gnabry when he's fit, although the last two um, are almost certainly not going to be, although we'll see what happens with Coman. But defensively, they're a mess in mm. transition. That That's the big problem. I, it's funny, actually. I was looking at some data before the Leverkusen game to do the tactical feed commentary, and I was kind of comparing... Um, 
Leverkusen and Bayern. And you look at Bayern, the ca- the press is very good. The counter press, they they win more kind of high regains than anybody. But when that breaks down and it doesn't happen, that's when they're in big trouble. So they ask the centre backs to do so much, and it kind of ties in with what Emmett said about Dyer and mm. um, uh, Delict, because they're the kind of lock if the counter press doesn't work. And I just think they do take an awful risk if that press doesn't work. If you can play through that pressure, you can get at Bayern, no doubt. Yeah, I, suppose, I suppose every week in the Bundesliga as well, they have to sort of play with Hugh's expectation as well. They dominate the ball, aren't they? And I don't think really that suits suits their style at all when they have to try and sort of unpick defences by sort of being clever with possession. Yes. Um, yes. And I just, I just think this game just might be might be again where Arsenal dominate possession and Bayern can sit off a little bit and the home the home fans are probably going to accept that I think because they know how well it worked in the in in the in the first leg so I I do think they're, the, they're sort of a team that strike me that could be suited to being the perceived underdog still whether they don't have the ball and they can sort of, as you say unleash those those transitional um counter attacks that that, that they they're, they're so good at and so I thought Sane was absolutely amazing on in that in that first yeah. thing he, he was really in his element so um yeah and Bayern Munich have Harry Kane as well don't they and Arsenal don't and I do think that's a big big a big edge in this um when you when you're sort of pricing up a game like this and and obviously it's going to be massive in those key moments in front of goal but um, and hopefully he can bring his, his usual ruth, ruthless streak. But I, th- I do think his battle with um, Saliba, Saliba and Gabriel actually was a fascinating watch in the first leg. It was a really sort of physical, intense matchup. And Kane doesn't shirk a challenge like that. He does he does like to to get down and dirty with these centre-backs that try to sort of ruffle him. Um, and I'm expecting more of the same, actually, with Kane's sort of know-how and shrewdness um, up against the sort of likely pumped-up Arsenal duo, shall we say, when... Um, who tend to play worse the bigger the game? That's the thing that the, the trend at the moment is that these two are are becoming a little bit too chaotic. You don't really want that from a centre back partnership, especially those two have been so good for so long. Um, and I think that that sort of panic and naivety can be seen um, by Saliba and Gabriel's performances in the knockouts that by that Bayern game and also in the in the in the Porto game. Um, and that that sort of unusual rashness to their game that can be seen through their um, fouls committed count. So in the three knockout games with Porto and Bayern, they made twelve fouls between them, which are, are sort of quite be- bewildering numbers, really, for centre backs yeah, yeah, yeah. of their sort of ilk. And they all usually play with such assurance, don't they? So they're they're very sort of I think they they they're liable to get a little bit rattled here. I think and Saliba has made seven of those fouls and Gabriel five. So. This means Saliba has made more fouls in those three games than he has in his last 11 Premier League games combined. Um, and this is a player that's only averaging 0.62 fouls per 90 minutes and has made just uh, more than two fouls in just five of his last 52 starts. So it's a very sort of an erratic, a very a strange figure um, to, to make seven fouls in three games in, in this environment. I do think it's in the environment that's making making those rash decisions from um, Saliba. So yeah, as I mentioned on the the weekend pod about centre backs being priced up quite what I'd call lazily by the algorithms that the bookmakers use to um help with the to get to that sort of yeah price Emmett. The, look at Emmett foul... looking sheepish in the corner there <laughs> exactly any, any anywhere anywhere where an algorithm steps in I think we can we can um we we can make our move so um so the centre back uh, foul numbers are always and price is always something which I'm really interested in especially when a player like Harry Kane is the one they're trying to. They're trying to stop because he's, he's just a foul winning machine, and he, he won six fouls in the first leg at the Emirates. So he's going to be um, to the fore again, I think. And we didn't quite land with our um, Zanka bet from the Brentford versus um, Sheffield United game at the weekend uh, up against Big Ben and Bernie for the Blades. Um, as oh, it was yeah. the other set. Cent- other centre back Nathan Collins actually made the foul in the end, which so we got the wrong centre back. Um, but I'm not losing confidence in the um, in this uh, betting strategy though. So I'll definitely be. Um, Keeping an eye on the Saliba and the, the Gabriel fire, the foul numbers on Wednesday. There's no markets up yet, unfortunately, on Betfair. But my advice would be to take anything bigger than sort of eight to eleven for Saliba to make one foul, and then anything around sort of three to one or more for him to make uh, two or more. And as as I sort of mentioned in, on the weekend pod, you can also combine uh, the foul counts with a centre back. So the option of combining both Saliba and Gabriel to make at least one thra- one foul through the bet builder um, should come out at around six to four. And, that, and that's a bet that would have landed in um, the game, the two matches against Porto and against Bayern. So I can see that landing again at an odds against price. And also, again, if you, if you want to dream a bit and we want to put them both to win two or more fouls um, 
in the game up against Kane, um, which did land in the first leg, obviously. If you combine the two of them both to make two fouls um, at least, you can get yourself an eight to one shot there. So, yeah, I am very much in the buying camp uh, for this one and I'll be keeping an eye on those uh, Saliba and Gabriel prices uh, for fouls committed when they arrive on the Betfair site. Now, we know that injury time goals could be a pain in the pocket if they ruin your bet. So now you've got 90-minute payouts to rescue you if the clock hits 90 minutes and you've got the right result as it stands. Your bet wins when the match ticks into injury time. T's and C's in the description, 18 plus. Be gambleaware.org. Brilliant game in the Spanish capital last week, 3-3 between Real Madrid and Manchester City. Emmett, do we expect it to be as chaotic again? Obviously, Real will have a bit of a hangover from what happened uh, last season when they went to the Etihad and got absolutely smashed. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's it's kind of a, a real tough scene for uh, unders backers in, in the Champions League when you've uh, a game with one one point four expected goals that has six goals and some of the some of the greatest kind of one of the greatest feats of kind of of uh, low xg finishing the, the European football has seen. So that was that was, it was that amazing, was, wasn't it? I it mean, it was amazing. Yeah, was... Bardiol with one of the bounciest first touches you'll ever see that set him up perfectly to smash one in on his wrong foot. I mean. <laughs> Once that goes in, you think, right, well, this is just a carnival of chaos, isn't it? Yeah, and like, um, absolutely. And the Phil Foden goals, this is a lot there. He reminded me of some of the really great players in that sense that when he got the ball there, you thought that you thought it was going in. So I think that's maybe, like I said, obviously, I think with football, it's... Um, it's a very random sport. It was only last season that Marcus Rashford is playing like one of the best uh, forwards in Europe. I'm not bitter, obviously, but um, <laughs> the, but but like is in the, if obviously if I thought I was fo- giving you a week off from talking yeah, about United. Yeah. We'll Good see resist. if we'll, we'll see if Foden can sustain it. But at the moment, he's playing at an absolutely absolutely world class level, and he's actually listeners might be interested to know he's been a huge mover in the kind of Ballon d'Or market. Or, or, whereas and he was kind of where we originally originally priced him up he was kind of maybe 66 to 1 or something like that um a, a few months ago and he's and he's now moved, moved into around i think it's around maybe 10 or 12 to 1 obviously he's going to be part of he's part of a team that are favored for the champions favorites of the champions league favorites of the premier league and obviously england england will be favorites for the for the euros also um for this game i think it's it's I'm kind of my 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 main angle here is I just I think Real are Real Madrid are vulnerable away from home. Um, if you look at their La Liga performance this year, if you look at expected goals against away from home, they're fourth in La Liga, which you wouldn't expect given their given they're kind of fairly comfortable in the lead at the top of the table. If you look at their Champions League away ties this season. When they were away at Braga, gave up 16 shots and over 1.5 expected goals. Away at Napoli, over 17 shots and over two expected goals. Gave up 15 shots at Leipzig, and Leipzig should have scored more than yeah. more than one Leipzig goal. Leipzig should have knocked them out. Is the truth yeah, exactly. Really and and I, I would all I, exactly. I, I feel as well the kind of the the home tie at the Bernabeu was a bit like an away performance for Real when they sat back, and and Leipzig really stormed and kind of stormed the game and dominated. If, if it wasn't for um, for Openda's kind of way and, and Leipzig generally wayward fi- finishing that, that game could have at least gone to extra time so I and was with City and City are just incredibly strong at home like they haven't lost um, since kind of they did the game just for the World Cup break um, to, to Brentford and, and, and Ivan Tony a good Christmas 2022 in, in the Premier League and it's it's rare you say it but I, I, th- I think they're actually quite a big price to win the match I, I, it's in like the like they're when I last looked they were kind of around kind of one one sixty seven on the exchange and I kind of that's not that's not too dissimilar from the price they were playing kind of um, playing Liverpool at home in the, in the league last November and I I just I don't think Real I think Real have a habit to prove that 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 they're as good as Liverpool I would say or, or, or as, as good as the market thinks they are. I think they've like if you look if like they haven't they've had an easy draw in the Champions League. They scrape past a bad Leipzig team. And City away from home is the hardest assignment in European football in uh, by far and I I I think there's a, it's a live possibility. maybe not a quite repeat of last year, but 
But I think a comfortable City win is is most likely here. I wouldn't put listeners off looking at City in the kind of Asian, Asian handicap markets or even minus one on the handicap. I, I think I can think I can see City winning fairly comfortably. Another big thing is Kyle Walker was on the bench the weekend. If Walker is back, like he's That's he's huge. the one he's the one yeah. player in European football that that can not nullify, but he can like make, make he can make life quite difficult for Vinicius Junior. There's very few fullbacks in world football who can say that. Yeah, Mark, that first leg is the kind of game that brings Pep Guardiola out in hives, isn't it, really? Because they, they just don't... He, he, coaches like him hate that kind of chaos, don't they, really? But City actually, you know, managed to kind of ride the wave and get a decent result. And it's interesting, Evan's absolutely right, a trip to the Etihad is actually as tough as it gets in European football. But it's not, and Pep Guardiola's made reference to this before Manchester City fans start getting angry with me. Uh, it's not an intimidating venue in the sense that it's not like going to to Anfield or going away to Galatasaray or going away to like, you know, a really kind of oppressive atmosphere where the fans can be used almost as a kind of weapon for the home team. It's just not like that at Manchester City, but the team is so good the, that's what brings them through. Yeah, it's, it's not a cauldron, but in terms of footballing ability, it's there's it's, it's no harder task in world football than going to the Etihad and getting a result. So, yeah, the first leg was was brilliant, uh, a carnival of chaos, I think you described it as, which is, which is perfect, really. Some really high-class football on show in terms of chances created. It definitely wasn't a three-all, but, you know, you think of those long-range strikes, the cheeky free kick from Bernardo, Madrid getting a helping hand with a couple of deflections as well. But I think the intent from both sides was clearly there to try and play their part. And it ebbed and flowed. Both teams had spells of dominance. It was, it was just a great spectacle, really. Um, the last season these two teams played, the first leg was a, a much lower key affair. And before sort of City bulldozed them at, at the Etihad, I don't expect like Emmett it to be quite so emphatic this time around. But I do favour City. Carl Walker being available is a big plus, but having a fit and available Kevin De Bruyne as well. You know, both those two players were unavailable from the off. De Bruyne fell ill, um, so he wasn't able to start that game at the Bernabeu. So, you know, City immediately jump up a notch if either of those two teams, two players come into the side. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I can't really sort of add too much to what Emmett says there, but Walker's ability to to sort of deal with the the counters and transitions that's one area where, where Madrid really targeted in the first leg. They started Rodrigo down the left, surprisingly, and he had plenty of success in those transitions, countering City down their right hand side. And you know, if Walker plays, that avenue probably won't be quite as fruitful. Um, but then also from a Madrid perspective, Shumeni's suspension means they're going to have to play either Militao, who's not completely match fit after a, an injury, uh, or Nacho, who's had a, a bit of a difficult time this calendar year too. So they're not exactly down to the bare bones at centre-back, but um, I'm sure Ancelotti would have preferred either of those two potential centre-halves to be in a better sort of vein of form right now. But uh, yeah, anyway, my hunch is we'll see a, a similar style game, actually. Um, I don't see why Ancelotti would overhaul his approach, considering it worked pretty well last week. You know, sit back, respect City in possession, only really press when they come close to the penalty area. And when possession is broken up, you just hit them with some serious threats on the counter-attack. And, um, you know, by applying that methodology at the Etihad, um, you know, and being successful is clearly easier said than done. But I think you look at Arsenal, who pulled off a defensive masterclass here. Chelsea had relative success doing something similar. And I even remember Everton going here and frustrating Man City for a good hour or so before yeah. you know, Haaland scores a, a snapshot from a, uh, a corner. So, you know, this is a, a, I guess the flip side, this is a City side. We talked about Bayern Munich and their firepower. Man City have scored at least three goals in all nine of their Champions League games this season, which is quite incredible. It's very difficult to contain them, especially at the Etihad. However, they have only kept one clean sheet on the continent this season. If you look at the Premier League, just two clean sheets in the last seven home league matches. Um, and I think, you know, the flip side to City scoring is I think they still are a little bit get atable. And I think Guardiola said as much after the first leg in his post match press conference. He said they'll have to be on guard for did any Did he tactical... use the word get atable in that press conference? <laughs> no, but he did say <laughs> that he expects Madrid to score, which I think is quite something. Um, 
you know, he'll be on guard for any sort of tactical tinkering from Ancelotti as well. But, I, uh, you know, I thought it was quite revealing that he he expects Madrid to score. Maybe it's just um, he's playing on words there. But, um, yeah, my theory here is City will be too strong, even if Real Madrid come up and, and cause them problems too. So I was just looking at the numbers. City to win, 168 on the exchange. Both teams to score is around the same price. So the market is suggesting each wager has about a 60% implied chance of landing on Wednesday. Um, yet the combination of the two um, is quoted at uh, 21 to 10 on the sports book. And if you wait until Tuesday, you'll get a bigger price on the exchange, probably closer to 325 for Man City to win and both teams to score. And that suggests the, the combination of the two has about a 30% chance of landing. So um, basically half a chance of, of landing, even if BTTS is, is 60%. Um, yeah, it just doesn't really add up to me. If City win this, which I expect them to do so, I think Real Madrid will have their opportunities. There's too much quality in forward areas to, to not cause a City defence, which has looked ragged at times in transition. So yeah, I expect uh, probably another three, four goals in this game and, and City to come out on top. We know Real Madrid, they're so, so good and we are so, so get at <laughs> Yeah, I could, I, could see, I could see him taking that on maybe going forwards. Uh, Lewis, you uh, rightly have been on the Phil Foden train for quite some time about potentially being top scorer in the Champions League and he's rattling along. Yeah, it's going very nicely, yes. It's, um... Remind us what the price was when you got on and recommended... Well, well, it's the between between forty and fifty to one. When um, I think it was just before the Copenhagen Copenhagen first leg, I think, and he scored in, in in that one, and he was rested for the second leg, which puts which I thought might have put the bet um, on the back foot. But he, this this goal that he scored against um, Rao in the first leg has put us back in the put back in with with, with a shout. I think I might, uh, it's a top goal scoring market. It's always a popular one to punt on, isn't it? And and follow. So I thought I'd provide a bit of a, a state of play actually to see. Um, how we're looking on the Foden uh, situation and who's who's where and uh, and what on the prices. So Harry Kane's got seven at the moment. He's leading the way. And you've got three on six goals. You've got Griezmann, Haaland and Mbappe. And then you've got Foden amongst uh, five others uh, on five. So Alvarez for City, uh, Gelano for Porto is out of the competition. Hoyland for United is out of the competition and Morata. So I'd be surprised if anyone else can get involved unless Vinicius Jr. goes a bit wild um, at the Etihad on uh, uh, Wednesday. So, yeah, the betting is Haaland is the uh, five to four favourite, but I would reference that he hasn't scored in three appearances versus Real Madrid. And I thought actually the game passed him by uh, last week. I know this is a dangerous thing to say about Haaland. They didn't get the ball to him, did they? Out. I mean, we had a lot of shots of Rudiger pushing him and kind of shouting at him. But actually, mm. I, I do often think with him, just him being there, affects the game like yeah. people people always say oh you know he, he doesn't look good and his hold up plays rubbish and blah 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 but it's just the fact that he's there and people teams are so scared of him that it just ties up at least one defender and that's what makes the space for Foden to score that wonderful goal you know that, that does make a big difference Absolutely. I think we could do a whole podcast about whether Erling Harden makes um, Manchester City a better team or a worse team. So probably save that for for another day. We did only make two passes in the final third, actually, in that first leg, which is the lowest he's produced this season in any game. So I, I, I do think they did an OK job getting in around him. But as you say, the space was available for other players to exploit and Foden did that um, uh, brilliantly, didn't he? So, yeah, so we're on um, Foden, aren't we, at 40s, 50 to 1. Um, when the odds were a quarter for the first four. So he's in, we're in a good spot of getting a decent uh, payout, I think, with the sort of dead heat rules applying. He probably just needs uh, maybe one more goal to to secure that, I, I would say. But I do think Haaland's taken up too much of the market still, actually, here at, um, at five to four. And considering Kane's got the, the goals in the bank already, and with my uh, feeling that Bayern are going to head through against Arsenal, I do, I do think if you want to get involved, I do think Kane's the bet, actually, at... at um, Nine to four, but yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll just be um, I'll be watching back and hoping for a, a hundred to one Phil Foden hat trick. I think on um, uh, <laughs> uh, Wednesday that 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 would, that would do nicely. And I, yeah, he scored two two hat tricks in his last twelve starts, so it's um, you never know. It's that on. would really put that it's would on. really put a cat amongst the pigeons, wouldn't it? Um, but I, I am going to um just make a case for Real Madrid to qualify here actually at five to two, which which would be terrible for my Foden situation, obviously. But I do think at that five to two to qualify price, they are. They are a bet for me here. I, I wasn't expecting to see that price available. So I just think there's a lazy assumption that history is going to repeat itself like it did last season where um, City absolutely were phenomenal in that second league against Real Madrid where they absolutely took them um, to the cleaners. But I don't think we're seeing the same 
City I, City as we did last season. I'm not sure they've hit the heights uh, of that level of performance since since that day, really. And Madrid exploited City's vulnerabilities on the counter attack to such a dangerous level. I thought, and I always thought City were never comfortable trying to defend. Um, that front three. And I, I think this is why Madrid are the value across many sort of the markets, actually. And I think they're going to create so many um, uh, big moments. And it's it comes down to this, the fast breaks and the counter-attacks that they, that they they put together. I think Pep knows how vulnerable his team are. Um, and it's backed up by by the numbers. Um, so the fast break metric defined by Opta, which is another word for a counter-attack. I was just running some numbers this morning. And Man City have, can, have this, this stat... Staggeringly, they've conceded the most goals in the Premier League this season from fast breaks, so seven more than any other team, and they've conceded the most goals from fast breaks in the Champions League as well, five. So wow. this this equates to sort of twenty seven percent of all their goals conceded in the Premier League and the Champions League this season have come via a fast break. And what do Real Madrid? Um, are gonna, what how are Real Madrid going to play? How are they going to? set their attacks they're going to they're going to set them with fast breaks and counter attacks that's how they're going to score um their goals and now and arguably they've got the sort of an attacking trio that is among the best at doing that in the world in Vinicius Junior Rodrigo oh, 100% and Jude yeah, Bellingham 100%. so I, I just see, I just this is such a dangerous um sort of match scenario for Man City considering those numbers and people have argued that Carl Walker is back and that's obviously going to help with like recovery pace but he has he has he has started in in games this season where City have still been hurt on the the counter attack. I mean the two games against Chelsea, he started both games and um, I think that over the two games it was five all in the end. Chelsea managed to score five goals against them. Um, they they counter attacked brilliantly. Um, and Raheem Sterling, who um, Walker was supposed to be marking that day, scored in both of those games. So where he Walker was actually quite slow on the turn dealing with with Sterling, which sort I'm not going to say Carl Walker's absolutely finished at the game like Casemiro, but I do think he is regressing slightly in one on one situations, and I, 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 he is an unbelievable um, athlete and will be able to deal with Vinicius Junior for, for pace. But I just think if he can get him one on one inside the box, I do think there's a vulnerability there, and that also was was seen in Newcastle's. Um, game with Manchester City earlier this season when Anthony Gordon um gave Walker a torrid time cutting in on off his off the left onto the right. Again, and Gordon scored in that game as well. And Newcastle created lots of moments on the counter-attack that game. So I, I I'm I'm not too worried about Walker being back uh, as much as maybe the market is is expecting. Um but and although Emmett made a great case, didn't he, about Raoul's rubbish sort of away numbers but this this is just a team that defy all logic and metrics in the the Champions League they sort of have a sort of un, indescribable way of just staying in the yeah. staying in the game and staying calm under pressure and I I don't really like trusting my gut too much in betting I do like to to, to let the numbers speak but I do think when you've got a, a, a team like Real Madrid who are just um tooled up to the max to absolutely just um, flourish on the counter attack here against City's weaknesses. That five to two does really stand out, and I do think you've got to consider Vinicius Junior to score at any time as well. Eleven to four, um, and the twenty-two to one for him to score twice as well surely has to be of interest. I mean, he had three really decent chances in the first leg, um, and he's the man that that, that Raúl going to hit with their counter attacks, and he'll be on the end of those those um, transitions that end in the City box. So yeah. Combining Raúl to qualify and Vinicius Junior to score comes out at thirteen to two. So again. That's that's an angle. I'll def, I'll definitely be back in. If I'm going to have a, a bet on 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 route to, to qualify, I do think Vinicius Junior is the most likely to to get in on the act. So it makes sense to combine them two. But I'm not going to stop there either. I'm going to add Man City's card line into the mix as well. So over 1.5 cards um, looks big to me as well. I think it's around four to seven, which you can definitely throw into that bet builder mix. Just with the amount of um, quality and trickery in the, in the Real Madrid front line. So Camavinga is the third most fouled player in La Liga this season. Belling Bellingham is the sixth most fouled player in La Liga. And Vinicius Junior has won the second most fouls in the Champions League uh, um, across the last two seasons. But they not only draw fouls, they also draw cards as well. So ransom numbers from um, since the start of last season in La Liga. And Vinicius Junior gets a player booked every 150, uh, 150 minutes of action, which is quite a remarkable number that's 29 cards he's um drawn off the opposition since the last start of last season and um, Camavinga gets on booked every 198 minutes drawing 17 cards since last season and this season Bellingham sort of following following that suit as well he gets on booked 100 every 198 minutes so he's drawn 10 cards from the opposition um and Rodrigo's also won every 340 minutes so that that sort of attacking foursome are really going to cause City some problems in terms of when they're defending 
those counter attacks. So I just think with such sort of jeopardy at play and the counter attacking threat, which can lead to cynical fouls, um, which could sort of ramp up the the frustration levels on City City's part. I think the City card line is also a bet to throw into that um, Vinicius Junior and Real Madrid to qualify mix. So if you if you if you back Real to qualify, Vinicius Junior to score, and over one point five cards for City actually comes out at twelve to one. Um, and I think you can back those in singles, obviously, which is probably the more sensible way of doing things. But with all those variable variables sort of linked together, if one if one's going to happen, I think maybe two or three of them could as well. So I do think that 12 to 1 is definitely worth um, considering. It was already going to be an exciting game. I'm even more excited now uh, with the potential of some of those tips. Uh, if you want to be notified, by the way, every time a new episode of Football Only Better goes live, make sure you follow wherever you get your podcast. And for the YouTube version, make sure you like and subscribe to Betfair's new channel for non-racing content. Dortmund's whole season rests on their home game against Atletico Madrid. They were dreadful for the first hour of that game at the Metropolitano, but they somehow came out with a 2-1 defeat. So they are still alive in this tie, but Emmett, they're going to have to play a hell of a lot better. I know this doesn't seem mega scientific, what I'm about to say here, but do you feel like the first goal is utterly crucial to this? Because I think if they get the crowd involved, Dortmund, if they get that first goal, wipe out the deficit, then I think they'll probably go through. If Atleti somehow score the first goal, it could turn pretty quickly. Yeah, I think the the problem with betting on Dortmund here is is the is the, is the as 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 you kind of alluding to there is is their capability of blowing themselves up. Like I think the like the both 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 goals last week were really kind of self self inflicted wounds. Oh, and, if uh, you'd heard wah, 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 nah, 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 in the background, it would have fitted perfectly because Hummel's five hundredth appearance for Dortmund yeah. and Schlosserbeck basically getting in each other's way to defend a throw-in. One of the stupidest things I've ever seen in Champions League football. Yeah, again, not... Uh, those Dortmund defenders, not not friends to under his backers there last week was pretty, pretty disappointing. Um, <laughs> but but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll move on from that. But it was, again, it felt like really unfortunately, unfortunately for Atletico Madrid fans, I think classic Diego Simeone in that like that tie was up potentially over 2-0 if they'd really gone for the throat but by sitting back and, and kind of conceding the game they they, they kind of left it open to chance um, it was also interesting that Sebastian Haller who um, anyone who watched the African Nations Cup will know like made a massive massive impact on Ivory Coast that they were kind of that they were a fairly hopeless team in the group stages and their transformation from kind of team on the verge of getting knocked out to winning the tournament was mainly built on him I would say in his kind of efforts as a substitute and then kind of when he when he was starting in the kind of very latter stages um, and Dortmund's kind of starting striker this season Nicholas Fulkrug is kind of not not really a Champions League level striker and it was just even interesting with it that Haller kind of Haller really kind of improved Dortmund when he came on last week so it'll be interesting interested to see if, see if he starts this week I think well, he got kind of... crunched I'm not I must admit I don't know how badly yeah. he was injured but he got got crunched like three minutes into the game at Gladbach on Saturday and he had to go off. So he made his first start for ages, Yeah, got crunched by um, Nico Elvedi and had to go off like in the 10th minute. But I, I genuinely at this stage, I'm not quite sure whether he's fit enough to come back, but it was a real shame for him. I mean, he looked absolutely crushed, bless him. He's it's, had such a nightmare time of it. Yeah, it's, as well in this game, it's a real centre forwards game in the sense that because the way Atletico play as well, like Atletico are twelfth in La Liga for shots conceded. They're also in the bottom half in terms of corners conceded as well. So that just kind of reflects the way they play. There, it's a reactive style of play where they're kind of sitting deep, um, kind of allow, allow allowing a lot of shots, allowing the opposition to have territory, but kind of trying to defend their own defend their box really well. So kind of in those really tight spaces where you have to operate kind of can the centre forward be clinical can he find a little bit of space can he kind of in the one or two chances he gets get 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 make make the difference so I do think if Haller didn't play I think it, it'll be a really big game for full Krug and the kind of Dortmund forwards can can they be clinical I, I'd i be reluctant to bet on that to, put, put, to be honest and I'd be reluctant to take it let go given their struggles away from home so the angle I like for this game is kind of 
what I mentioned there. I was just looking at kind of, I think the way this game will go, it's very likely we'll have Dortmund on the front foot because I just, I can't see, it's very unlikely I feel that Dortmund will keep a clean sheet against Morata, Griezmann and and and, 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 and just the way Dortmund played and then the nature, they're, 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 they're poor defensively, they're not to be trusted. So if they were, if they were to concede one goal, the, 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 that means that they'll need, they need to score two to at least take it to extra time. So I think the kind of game script of the way this game will shape will likely be Dortmund pushing forward for most of the game and let it go sitting back so I like I was looking at either, either Dortmund team shots or Dortmund team corners and the, 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 and the one I'll go for is Dortmund over six and a half corner at evens I think I think I can see them racking up, racking up the corners against the Atletico sitting deep yeah that makes a lot of sense to me Mark how do you see this one going because Atletico we've known all the way through the season really at the Metropolitano brilliant away from home terrible a lot of the time yeah, um, very similar lines to, to Emmett, really. Um, they look like rabbit in the headlights, really, for that first half hour, at least, uh, in Madrid. Um, and whether They're so it was... annoying, They're, honestly, because obviously, as somebody who covers the Bundesliga a lot, I've got a soft spot for Dortmund. I want German teams to do well. And you just... I've seen them play so well in the Champions League at times this season. And that first hour was just like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> so bad. But let's, let's swing it around and be positive. Edin Terzic has been uh, after the Madrid game and still is looking forward to the, the second leg, whether it's tactical from Atletico, complacency, a bit of fatigue, maybe a bit of all three, really. But in the second half, they were looking jaded and did start to look a bit fragile and Haller's introduction obviously helped. But, you know, he scored the goal, but they still hit the woodwork twice after that consolation strikes that they could easily have, have drawn that game um, or even more really um, so they'll be feeling good about themselves I know Terzic is is very enthusiastic um, Dortmund's record at home in the Champions League is very strong just one defeat in 17 Champions League matches now and they're unbeaten at home in the Champions League uh, since November 2021 uh, even Man City failed to win here so um, the Dortmund Dortmund's draw no bet angle has been gobbled up by the market in the last 24 hours unfortunately but you can see why um, as you've discussed already Kev the Atleti's away record uh, sketchy at best five wins on their travels in La Liga from 15 just one in four in Europe this season if you look at the Champions League record away from home 15 defeats in the last 30 away games 50% loss rate that's pretty poor six clean sheets in that sample of 30 games as well and just one in the last 13 away in this competition so um yeah, it's very difficult to, to put your finger on why they've been struggling so much in La Liga this season, but uh, certainly they can't be trusted going into this game for me. So um, I think it's a difficult game. I think you're absolutely right. The first goal could be crucial. So I'm quite happy to sort of take myself out of the equation of the match odds and the Asian handicap, etc., uh, and look elsewhere. So I've also got a Dortmund corners base selection, but I'm going to package it together with something else. So I've got Dortmund over four and a half corners uh, as the first leg of a two leg uh, bet builder. Uh, Dortmund are averaging five and a half corners at home in the competition this season. They forced eight in Madrid last week and Atletico lost the corner count 11-5 at Lazio, 9-4 at Feyenoord, 3-2 to at Inter and could only draw 4-4 four, four on corners uh, against Celtic and they give up an average of five in La Liga. So you could even back Dortmund to win the corner count as well if you like to boost it a bit further. But um, the, the main play I like here is um, Dortmund's left back, or he's a bit more of a left wing back, Ian Matteson, to commit at least one foul. Um, now, I'm not going to put him quite in the Teo Hernandez category, but he's not as headless and brainless as, as Hernandez, but he, he will get up and down that flank quite often. Yeah. He does provide a lot of quality on the ball. He's very energetic in and out of possession, likes to get stuck in too. He's one of those players, I believe, that when the ball is being sort of on the way out and he's jocking a player, he just can't help himself by pushing that player over and committing a foul yes. unnecessarily. Yes. Uh, still lacks a Could bit of experience. He got sent off, actually, on Saturday. He went in for a really early challenge and he was lucky that he got a tickle on the ball because he got booked. And he could ease, if he hadn't got the ball, I think he goes. So, yeah, he just I agree with you completely. I, I like him a lot, but he's just got that raw edge still where he... He just does odd things and he can't resist. Yeah. I mean, look at the look at the first leg. I mean, <laughs> who who plays the ball across their own area? It, <laughs> you know, I, I know Coble played him into trouble a bit, but why would you go that way across your own area instead of turning out the other way? So yeah, that there, there are he's a young player, so yeah. he's still learning the game. So yeah, I think you're right.
Exactly. So he, he joined Dortmund in January. He started 16 games for Dortmund across all comps. He's committed at least one foul in 13 of those. He's around four to nine, I think, for a repeat in this match. And I, I do like that as a kind of single to add to your bet builder. So, you know, Molina, Llorente, down that channel, Griezmann will drift as well. You know, all three of them are pretty useful at drawing fouls. And, and Matteson doesn't normally need too much encouragement. So just combine the two and you're getting close to nine to ten. Yeah, Lewis, it's funny with Atletico, isn't it? Because... We always think of Diego Simeone and your reflexes always are. They'll be, you know, really compact and really tough to break down. But to use one of Pep Guardiola's famous phrases, I think they are get atable. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Kev. Yeah, that's the perfect phrase. A classic uh, pepinism. Pepinism, is that a word? Pep oh, pepinism. Word. Yeah, yeah. Pepinism. Yeah. All, we're, we're, <laughs> we've got all these terms and the terms flying out on the podcast today. Yeah, and I was, I was blogging the Atletico um, Madrid first leg, actually, against Dortmund. I'm just going to add to the uh, crap football cliches that you guys have already mentioned about first goal is crucial, etc. By saying it was a it was a game of two halves. Yes. So. <laughs> um, yeah. No. Dortmund played the first 15 minutes, didn't they? Like a sort of kick about in Hackney Marshes. I thought it was yeah, so bizarre, so, so weird. I can I can, I, I can sense the uh, sense the disappointment in your voice regarding their um, performance on the sort of the big stage like that. So yeah, I can totally get that. And this, this, the Atletico didn't really allow Dortmund anything. In the first, I'd say thirty minutes or so. So I was when I was when I was uh, doing the live blog. I had the sort of the touches in the box um, stat running alongside, and by the thirty-second minute, Atleti had twenty-three in Dortmund's box, and Dortmund had had zero in Atleti's box, which is <laughs> crazy for a game which was supposed to be quite a. Um, I think it was nearly priced up as being pick them really on the qualification uh, to qualify um, situation. You'd normally see those stats when, say, Manchester City are playing Luton or something like that. So it was a really, it was a terrible start from Dortmund, but they did they did improve in the second half, didn't they? But I still didn't think they didn't really trouble Oblak until sort of final 10 minutes or so. And they actually yeah. were quite fortunate that the goalkeeper rescued them. I think it was on about 75 minutes when, was it Lino, the... Um, Oh, massive save. Massive yeah, the back, save the back from post. Lino. Yeah, that goes yeah, in, huge. the game's over, isn't it, really, I think. So the tie's over. So... Yeah, that Haller goal came at a really good time because it came out of nothing and they got the goal and they sort of grew in they grew in those final 10 minutes and they actually could have nicked the draw, couldn't they? I mean, Brandt's header coming off the off the woodwork late on really was an exciting finish. Um, but I think this is set yeah. up to be a really close game, actually, again. Um, and I totally, totally see the, the home advantage for, for Dortmund um, being a really big factor in the outcome. But I do think that's going to be sort of cancelled out by the genius that is Griezmann, really. I think any game that he's involved in, you have to give that... That team a huge chance, even in a really tough away day like at Dortmund. His assist for the goal, as we, again for Lino, was just like pure silk, wasn't it? It was such oh, a lovely so little good. flick. Yeah, he's he just ridiculously good. <laughs> yeah, I think he'd actually get in my um, world eleven at the moment. If I was picking a world eleven, I think Griezmann would probably be be yeah. in there in that pocket. So yeah, he ran the show actually. I thought in the game again, just I think he created six chances in the match, and that was including the assist. And that's the most chances he's actually ever created in a Champions League game. Um, I read a stat from Opta. So yeah, that was um, it was great to see. Just like a fine wine, isn't he? Really? He's just getting better and better and he's actually got seven Champions League goal involvements this season now for Atletico so five goals um, and two assists so if Atletico, if Atletico still stay in um, if they can get through this tie he might be a runner actually in the uh, the top goal scorer market because he's on five so he's um, he could be a threat to to our Phil, Phil Foden bet um, and he's just someone that drags Simeone's men through games isn't he he's um, yeah, well I, I mean I, they I, don't I, beat into without him it's as simple absolutely. as that absolutely and he Absolutely. was on one leg, effectively, in that game. And yet he still managed to drag them through. He was Herculean in that game. Yeah, that's the per that's, that's the perfect term. And this is why I think I've got to keep an Atletico um, angle on side in this game. But I, ju I just think it's it's a case of if it looks like it's going to penalties, smells like it's going to penalties, feels like it's going to penalties, <laughs> then probably it's going to penalties. I could, And I really like the prices, actually, surrounding the fact of um, it, it going to extra time and penalties. And Dortmund... Dortmund winning by one goal is eleven to four, which gets you probably the two most likely winning scores on your side in one nil and and two one, and obviously that would that would take the game to extra time. So I do think if you fancy Dortmund to win the game by one goal, I do think you might as well be a bit greedy and turn that eleven to four shot into a six to one shot and just back the game to go to penalties. And I do think that jump is too big from eleven to four to six to one. Um, purely on the basis that you only really need to get through an extra thirty minutes of probably what will be a quite a a predicted sort of tight cagey stalemate. I've, I've, I don't have the numbers, obviously, but I've, I've watched so many 
get a knockout football games in my lifetime and it does feel that extra time does sort of pass with both teams not really wanting to take risks or are quite heavily yeah. fatigued so the game in extra time does always feel like it it can drift and so I always would rather just back the game to go to penalties just in a game where there's a knockout situation rather than just just back the draw um, and I do think actually penalties would I think both teams would shake hands actually on, on a penalty shootout to seal their fate with such sort of high stakes involved so and then seeing sort of Oblak versus Kobo in the penalty shootout would be quite fun, I think, as well. That'd be so, great. That'd be yeah, really it would. Good. So, I, I can yeah. definitely, I can definitely see a situation where the game um, ends with a one-goal um, victory for for Dortmund, and then that six-to-one shot looks looks um, like a huge runner. So, yeah, I'll be cheering on um, penalties in this one, Kev. Lovely stuff. Um, Barcelona PSG battle between uh, Xavi and Luis Enrique know each other very well. I think Xavi won that first leg. By quite some distance, actually. Mark, it was a weird game because Barcelona led, Harris took it to 2-1, then fell apart and Barca won it 3-2. But I got the sense watching that game that Barcelona were a threat all the way through. Harris only in fits and starts. I know they're both flawed, but it did seem to me that Barcelona were the more cohesive unit in that first leg. I wouldn't disagree with that. I think... um... It was only really that 15, 20 minute spell after half time um, when PSG did sort of dominate the game for, for a little period. They obviously scored twice as well when it looked there. The game looked to be there for the taking for them. But then Pedri comes on and Pedri does Pedri things and the game turns again. And there was plenty of twists and turns. But yeah, I think Barca just about edged it. Um, very absorbing game, very entertaining game. Um, and this fixture has got a history of goals, but uh, I'm hopeful we're going to get to see something similar uh, on Tuesday night. Barca in the driving seat, of course. But I think from a PSG perspective, a, a trip to the Olympic Stadium is far less intimidating than the Camp Nou. So they can't be dismissed in this game, um, even if I was disappointed in their performance last week. Um, a little bit disappointed in the, in the team shape and the setup and the approach from Luis Enrique too. Um, and Bappe sort of playing through the middle um, for the most part was... Felt a little bit wasted at times. He was restricted to just three shots, none of which were on target. Had the fewest touches of an outfield player for PSG to play the full 90 as well. Uh, but it's not often he has two sort of quiet games like that in the big matches that matter. So I'd expect a response and I expect a, a tactical shift from PSG here with Hikimi back from suspension. He'll slot in at right back. It means Marquinhos can go back to centre-half. And I think they're going to make some amendments to their midfield too. I mean, Asensio was, was anonymous. He won't be playing. I think Kang will, will probably miss out as well. Uh, so yeah, Walter... Team selection was weird, right? It was just really weird. Like Asensio was kind of played as a false nine for a bit. That didn't work. It was just, it's a classic Luis Enrique kind of, I'm yeah. going to do this. Don't do that. It's really silly. No, I'm going to do it anyway. He's done a pep now a couple of times in the Champions League this season, and it's been yeah. difficult to try and understand what he's trying Newcastle to achieve. Away. What yeah, a disaster I mean, that, was, that was. That was yeah. the obvious one. But uh, yeah, Zaire Emery should be starting here, I think, and possibly Barcola too. But either way, I, I think PSG will see a better side of them. And I think Hakimi especially um, just gives them so much more thrust down the right-hand side. And also the recovery pace to potentially deal with Barca if they do start to play a bit more direct because that's how they had a lot of joy in that match actually it was playing direct over to Rafinha's side um, and yeah PSG have had a weekend off as well so they should be well prepared too and I think from a Barca perspective um, yeah it all went pretty well last week but two suspensions to Christensen and Sergio Roberto means they're going to have to rejig that midfield now players are back fit and available but uh, it sounds like De Jong and Gundogan are going to play in a bit more withdrawn midfield pivot role with Pedri playing just in front because Pedri's not quite fit enough to get box to box yet. So they're going to have to sort of sacrifice Gundogan and, and his um, ability to get forward and attack to just be a bit more assured there in midfield, which uh, is something to watch uh, potentially in the fouls and tackles markets. But um, yeah, I mean, going back to the, the, the issue at hand, I think goals, I mean, it's, it's difficult to sort of dismiss goals between these two teams. 11 of their last 13 Champions League meetings have seen both sides score, an average of 377. Pre appreciate a lot of those matches came under different regimes, but um, Barca have impressed defensively, defensively this season, especially at home. But I think 
you know, it's very difficult to deny PSG a goal. They've only drawn a blank twice this season and uh, obviously they're chasing the tie too. Um, so this will be interesting, I think. Um, but defensively, I'm sure Emmett will probably bring this up. So sorry to steal your thunder if you are. Um, but um, yeah, defensively, PSG in Ligue 1 have been absolutely hopeless away from home. They are fourth <laughs> worst in terms of their expected goals against figure. 173 per game, which is quite astonishing, really, considering their superpower in that division. And in the Champions League, both teams have scored in every away game so far for PSG. So I'm going to back both teams to score and top it up by backing over three and a half cards to give give us uh, a five to six shot. Istvan Kovacs is the referee, uh, the Romanian. He's quite a hard taskmaster. Averages close to five cards per game in the Champions League, excluding qualifiers. And this season, uh, he's given at least four in four of his five Champions League ties. And he did the Inter Atletico first leg and brandished six cards that day. So, you know, when required, he is quite reliable to get them out. So, yeah, four cards or more and both teams to score. Emmett, do you have any thunder left? It's pesky O'Hare <laughs> nicked it all. Yeah, not not. Joys are going first. Sorry, Emmett. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's um, yeah. I I think I think I think I think this is really interesting. I think that Barcelona are actually now a bet to win the Champions League. Um, that's my. I I, I think they're they're an eight point on the exchange. I think the vulnerability of the English teams is big. I think obviously. Just to, just to clarify, the main reason for this is if Barcelona get through here against PHG, which I expect them to, they'll have Atletico or Dortmund in the in the semi finals. I'm pretty confident they can beat both of those times. They'd they'd be they'd be decent favourites. Maybe I don't know one sixty six maybe against Atletico to qualify something in around there. Well, they just won and their three 0 didn't they? Exactly. So that was before after the, I think the hundred and twenty minutes extra time. But even still, yes. Even still, even even no, I mean, even still, I, I'd be confident that Barcelona could take that tie against Dortmund. I think Barcelona is a different level team from from Dortmund, and I'd expect them to come through that. I kind of mentioned this last week that like Barcelona have a similar profile to Inter last season, in that their expected goals and their kind of underlying numbers are kind of. Are, are are kind of much better than their league for, to their league form suggests. They have better expected goals numbers in 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 the league than Real Madrid, and they've kind of because the only the only way Barcelona were going to find their way out of this kind of levers financial mess they put them for levers slash financial mess they put themselves in was by La Masia producing a handful of gems and wouldn't you know La Masia is starting to <laughs> produce a handful of gems yeah. in terms of as you, as you mentioned they have children playing but children playing very successfully in uh, Le Minuel and Kubarsi at centre half how uh, good does he look by the way he, he's unbelievably good yeah, and as well, I think if you're if you're a real football fan as well, like the it was it was a beautiful thing to see Pedri come on and, and put that pass he did last yes. week. I think, yes. uh, and, and from a betting point of view, I just think Barcelona are stronger than last week. I know Christensen's out, and that's not ideal. But having having they kind of went into that game with, with De Jong just coming back from injury, and and, and De Jong is now, has a bit of match practice. I think like Pedri, like Pedri, Gundogan. And De Jong is, is a very strong midfield three, and I can compare that to say the likes of Sergio Roberto. They've been lining out Christensen a converted centre half. So I think that, I think Barcelona are stronger, and I, 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 like even Lewandowski, who's played in fits and starts this season, thought some of his link up play was very strong. He was coming deep, and he was being that yeah, kind of yeah. that that yeah. kind of pivot to counter attacks, which I think is kind of the secret sauce for 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 strikers. We saw a bit from Ollie Watkins yesterday as well. Um, so I. I I think Barcelona are, 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 are really are playing extremely well. As Mark said, you, you can't. I think one thing we can rely on is kind of PSG defensive vulnerability. Like the they're defending at set pieces for Barcelona's winner last week was very poor. It was very noticeable. This was what I remember early in the game. They're taking us at a long punt down the field, and Rafinha nearly scored from it. So oh, it was unbelievable. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it was yeah. like a like, national league south. One hundred percent. Like here's the tactical plan. You just boot it long, and and, 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 and we'll get a big chance off it. So I think I think that's I think I think we can rely on Barcelona getting a lot of chances this. Week and hopefully that they could they can convert enough of them. The goal expectancy is so high. I, I can see this being maybe a high scoring draw. So I think the better play, I think, is back um, Barcelona to reach the final. You can look at maybe trading out once they get there, depending on opposition. But I, I think Barcelona have a really strong chance of making the final now. And yes, I know there's probably really good sides in National League South. Stop shouting at me. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the Europa League briefly. Uh, West Ham against Leverkusen. Lewis, I know you want to look at this one. Leverkusen uh, won the league at the weekend. 
And Xabi Alonso, for the big game that could have won them the league, made seven changes and left out Alex Grimaldo, Jeremy Frimpong, Florian Vietz, who came on at halftime anyway and got a hat-trick. And uh, <laughs> he's clearly had an eye on this second leg because having won the league, they're going to play second-tier opposition in the final of the Pokal. This is the one that really they should now prioritise between now and the end of the season. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I, I do think this might be a bit of a stroll in the Olympic Park for Le- Leverkusen just by the um, um, the way that they've prioritised the, the, this game. And I don't think that the, the great celebrations that we saw when they won the league and on the weekend will come into play at all. I think I, I think Xabi Alonso's far too shrewd for that, to let that affect any any um, uh, plans for the game. So yeah, I think that second goal actually in that in that first leg was a real. Real hammer blow for David Moyes' men, wasn't it? I think that probably uh, puts them out. You the... did there, very good, Pat... very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think just clearly Leverkusen are the far superior side than West Ham, really here. But yeah. anyway, but then you're taking Lucas Paqueta and Jared Bowen out of the side for for West Ham, and that becomes uh, what I would what I would define as a huge mismatch, actually, and one that isn't really being um, factored into the prices available. Um, so Paqueta is suspended, surprise, surprise, and um, Bowen has been desperately trying to get himself fit for this game after a knee issue but the early signs are that you probably won't be risked now just with a West Ham still trying to fight to get into Europe in the Premier League and also his Euro um, his European place uh, the Euro Championships up for grabs still for it for England so I don't, the, the early the early signs are that he won't be risked either so without those two I'd argue that West Ham are actually Premier League relegation candidates um, that are playing in a, a Europa League quarter final against the best team in Germany so um so there's no real evidence to suggest how much they'll miss Paqueta and Bowen because they're both, Bowen's normally quite reliable and plays a lot. Paqueta um, has played a lot as well. So, uh, but they've only been, they've been without both of them for two matches in the last two seasons and they lost 2-0 at Brentford in the Premier League and were knocked out of the Carabao Cup at Bla- uh, against Blackburn at home. So, it, Paqueta is such a massive player for West Ham and I think I've mentioned these numbers before um, to back that up. Um, so with him, him and the team, so that's 53 games. Um, West Ham averaged 1.6 goals per game with him. And in 18 games without him, they um, averaged 0.6. So that's a whole... Bloody that's hell. one goal. Yeah, that's one <laughs> one goal responsible um, uh, Paqueta's influences is on this West Ham team. So in a, in a low scoring sport like football, that's just that is absolute an enormous drop, isn't it? A whole from a big goal sample per size game. as well. 18 games they've played without him. So, and 53 with him. So the sample size is something we can sort of take a lot of um, uh, weight from as well. So, um, and if you take Bowen out of the equation as well, then I'm struggling to see how West Ham can score actually in this game against one of the, the best defences in Europe. So Leverkusen have conceded just 19 goals all season. So that's 0.65 Per game, they faced the fewest shots, fewer shots on target, kept the most clean sheets, um, fifteen. So, I just see this as a huge mismatch on a game in a game that Leverkusen are going to be taking really, really seriously. And David Moyes actually said after the game in Germany, "Let's try and get one, and then see if we can get two. Well, I think they'll get zero here. So, Jesus, the pri- there's the pri- a strategy, isn't it? The, the, the price is the price is available. In West Ham not to score or under 0.5 West Ham goals is two to one. So a, a buy Leverkusen clean sheet is two to one, which I just think is begging to be um, snapped up. And I would just I would just wait to see if Bowen makes it or not. But the early signs are that that he won't be available. So if there's no no uh, obviously gonna be no Paquetta, and if there's no Bowen on the team sheet, and that price is still two to one uh, for West Ham not to score, I do think that's a huge pl- huge runner because if Leverkusen get in front, then this game is just going to drift big style because I think the, the the home fans will. Um, Leave. Exit on mass, won't they? They'll exit <laughs> yeah. on mass and the game will just drift and it'll be a bit of a procession for Leverkusen. So yeah, the West Ham not to score in the game at two to one really stood out to me. That's all we have time for on this edition of Football Only Better. Please do remember to gamble responsibly. Remember, we've got our usual weekend previews later in the week. All of our shows on our non-racing channel on YouTube. So make make sure you like and subscribe. And we've got loads of good European coverage on our website, betting.betfair.com. From Mark, from Emmett, from Lewis and from me, it's goodbye for now.